If I can introduce um, our next speaker, Wayne Hemingway, known to probably all of you now um, as the chair of our DMA Awards this year. Um, Wayne built Red or Dead from a humble shop in Camden um, into a global fashion label. Uh, many of us remember wearing it, and it kind of marks out um, our teenage years. Um, he won British Fashion uh, Council Street Style Designer of the Year three years running, and after 21 consecutive seasons on the catwalk um, at the London Fashion Week, uh, he sold the label. Um, and of all things that you might think he might go into next, um, a consummate designer, a real um, innovator with an appetite for new challenges, he set up Hemingway Design, um, specializing in affordable social design and housing. Um, and this too has won him a series of accolades. Today, Hemingway Design has become a multidisciplinary design agency, fashion, graphic, social design, um, and it's led by two generations of the Hemingway family. So who better today to um, put out a call for um, innovation from business leaders to literally get us to innovate our way out of recession. Thank you, Wayne. Right, thanks for inviting me. Um, I think I'll just... Lots of people keep telling me that um, I should tell our story um, more often, the, the story of how Geraldine and I got started, because it's quite typical of how the creative industries get started. And a lot of people um, assume that there's a, there's a, a set path through it and a, and a set path to, to starting a creative business. And uh, if there is a set path, we probably got the closest to it, and it's, by God, it's not set at all. Um, so we, like you just said, we, we design all sorts of things. There's nothing we wouldn't have a go at. I think the only thing we haven't probably dipped our toe in is proper scientific design uh, and maybe aeronautical design and things like that. We work on cars. We, we'll work on, on all sorts of things. Um, but how we, the, f the first thing is that we're in a, a very exciting time, I think, for innovation. In that f I'm on the trustee board of the Design Council and the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment. For the first time... Uh, I think it started with the last government. Uh, we didn't think it would continue with this government, but it is, that they actually accept that innovation uh, makes this country money uh, and something else as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's the second, second biggest driver of the economy as a creative industries now, at, at 15 billion. Well, that was two years ago. It's gone over 16 now. Uh, and the creative industries are growing at a time when obviously the, the economy is stagnant or, or declining. Um, very, very importantly as well, it's the second highest driver, a second highest employer uh, in the UK right now. And these figures have just been, just been published by the Design Council. And for the first time ever, we're able to, it's a pretty s significant bit of um, research that's been done and, and on, a, on a large scale. We're able to show that for every pound invested in design, it gives four, it seems hard to believe this, but I, and I kept questioning it, but you get 4.12 uh, pound increase in net operating profit, a 20 pound increase in turnover, uh, and very importantly, a 26 pound uh, return on, on uh, a, a social return on the investment. And I think that comes from the fact that if we're lucky enough to be in the creative industries, if we're lucky enough to be innovative uh, and work with innovation within our, within our businesses, it makes you happy. Hey, actually, look at that. What a fantastic sight. Forget it. There's a Scotty dog with two people paddling in the Thames. <laughs> <laughs> what a great person to be in, anyway. <laughs> I've just got to look at that for a minute. Um, but, so what I'm saying is that, you know, as well as, it, as well as the recognition now that it actually makes the country money, employs people, it actually gives us happiness. And um, my, my uh, granddad said to me, I was brought up by my granddad and my grandma and my mum, uh, that we're only here three score and ten. I think now we get, we're, we're lucky enough to get to four score, and, four score, not four score and ten, but four score. And uh, for, for you young uns, a score is 20. <laughs> Do the maths now. Yeah. Um, and, and, while, and he said, while you're here, the best thing that you can be and, and the most important thing you can aim for is happiness. And, and, that, and that's, you know, that's true. And we've all, I think we at Hemingway Design have always known that. But it also, we also know that if you can have money as well, money, you know, whatever, you know, Beatles said money can't buy your love, but it certainly can help towards, it can certainly help towards that happiness. And, uh, and, and so now we've got proof, absolute proof, with, with there's so many figures out there, 
you know, at school, the lowest truancy rates are in um, the creative industry subjects, mass art, sorry, <laughs> art, <laughs> art, design, and, and, and music. And, and the highest truancy rates are in maths, science, um, and, and we know that. In, you know, insiders, we know that. And why do you, and why do, why do kids play truant? Well, normally, because you don't want to do something. You know, because it, it, it makes you unhappy, it's boring. Uh, and so we've got something, you know, when we're talking about innovation, we've got something that's not boring, that's exciting, that young people want to do, that we all want to take throughout life with us. I, I'm 51. Uh, I started um, my business when I was 18. And I, I reckon I could count on, on the fingers of both hands the amount of days that I felt like I'm going to work. And that's got to be like... Oh my God, that's got to be up there. I mean, has Alan Shearer ever felt like he's gone to work? Probably not. So it's like, it's like you know, kicking a football and then sitting on being a pundit on match of the day. It's not work, is it? It's just bloody fun. You know, <laughs> there'll be the odd day where he can't score, where he didn't score a goal and he, miss, he missed a sitter. Uh, Alistair Cook out in, out in India pl playing cricket captain in England. Oh my God, is that work? He's just a bloody lucky man. He'll, have a, he'll, he'll go for three or four matches and get a duck. But... But he wouldn't change that for going to pack Chris in Leicester at Walker's Chris, would he? <laughs> you know, in put it all in boxes every day. So, you know, we've got to think about how lucky the fact that Britain is innovative. We have, that we have the best creative industries in the world, we, and we do, and the, and the rest of the world wants it, and they're getting it, and we, unless we fight very hard, but that's a political argument I haven't got time to get into here. Um, so we've, we've, we've got to protect it. And, and how, how does creativity start? Well... This is, a typical, this is a typical way of how it starts. And when I, when I do this at colleges, they, they look at me sometimes and think, you know, you're doing, you're doing us a disservice when I go to universities and talk about this. But I know so many people in, in the industries that I work in who started in a similar way. And it all started when I met Gerarding. Um, that's us up there when we were teenagers. Um, just a bit younger than that. We, we, went to, we both turned up at a disco in Burnley called uh, Angels. And it was a Northern Soul night, and I spotted this lovely-looking lass who'd, who'd made her own clothes, clearly had made her own clothes, on the dance floor. <laughs> no, look it, looking better than you'd buy in a shop, actually. No, that's because, uh, yeah, I mean, because you can make... You, you, uh, homemade clothes are better than anything you're going to buy in a shop, in my opinion, because they're more individual. Um, so she was there, looking fantastic, hair looking fantastic, pretty lass, as you can see, still is today. Um, um, uh, dancing to one of my fa favourite records... And uh, asked her for a dance, like you do. And 30 odd, 33 years, we're, st we're still together and still in love. But what, what we did, what we did um, soon after that is we decided the things that Jodie had left school at 15 with no qualifications whatsoever apart from a CSE grade C in art. And, and that's fairly typical. Uh, Paul Smith uh, didn't, get in, didn't, didn't study design. Vivian Westwood didn't di cover, didn't didn't study design, I can go on and on and on and on, who, you know, of, of famous household designers who you think will have gone through some system to reach where they are, and, and this kind of story is the same for all of them. The Vivian Westwood story is amazing. 17 years old, uh, open, opening a shop um, called Sex on the King's Road with, with a slightly older man who was a complete and utter lunatic, you know, all, all but this is, this, this is, this is how it starts. And, um, so, so we, we had, you know, these things in common, music, buying records, dancing, watching bands. Uh, and we decided at the age of 18 to move to London because there were more bands, more places to buy clothes, uh, more, more places to dance. Simple as that. You know, what a, what a, what a choice. We made, the, we made the right choice in life. Not through, not through listening to, to schools and saying you go down this route, just by following that thing about being happy. All the time, we've always had that as a mantra, what will make us happy? And we still say it throughout the business to everybody in there. If somebody doesn't work, we'll fucking kick them up the backside and say, you, you won't be happy until you work harder. But, <laughs> but intrinsically, we're, we're, look, we're looking for projects all, all the time uh, and, and things that will make us happy. Because if, if the whole team are doing things that they, that they want to do, they'll be more innovative, uh, they'll be happier, we'll get better results. I don't want to sound like a hippie, because I'm not a hippie, but it, it just works. You want to try it. It, re it really does work. You know that if you're happier, you work better. Um, 
Anyway, we went, we went to Camden. I'm not going to tell the story. We're not, not going to tell the story of Camden, but it was really simple. We just emptied our wardrobes onto, onto Camden Market. Half of it was Geraldine's clothes that she'd made. Half was my second-hand clothes. And off we went. We ended up within uh, a very short space of time, having 16 stalls. So, you know, that's, we went from, like, one stall and to, to there we had 16 stalls. We... We, we found out about these things called shoddy yards in Dewsbury, which, were, which is the, where the word shoddy clothing comes from, where all uh, rag and bone men took their clothes uh, to, to be recycled. They were pr prototype recycling yards. And we, from there, we were the only ones visiting these places. And we, we, we bought up just about every single 1950s printed dress that was, that, that, that was there, every single collarless shirt, every pair of old battered Dr. Martins, anything that we knew that, that we would wear in, in the clubs in London, um, we, we would buy for like 10p, 20p, bring it back down to London. That's Jerry Dean. We rented a space behind the dry cleaners on Wembley High Road, and that's, that's the, the lock-up behind the dry cleaners. It would all go there. Jerry Dean would sort it in between, sat there making clothes. Then it would go into the front of the dry cleaners, get washed, get dry cleaned, into a van, off, off down to Camden. And it got to the point where we were taking... At first, we got very quickly to taking £2,500 in, in, in our pouches there each, and then it got to 5000 because... That, I discovered that old Dr. Martins, my granddad had showed me how to repair them, and we were buying hundreds of old Dr. Martins from the Dr. Martins factory that were damage returns, where they'd split across the sole. We were, I had a group of mates soldering them with a, you know, with a soldering iron, um, and selling them on cap, buying them for 10p and selling them on Camden for 30 quid. Some of you are old enough to remember that, probably our stall on Camden, and some of you might have bought Dr. Martins offers and not even known that they'd been repaired. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, and we got to the point where we were making five grand each and we bought our... We, we were 20 years old or 21 and we bought our first house in London for cash. Um, and, and all the time we, we were learning and, and, and getting on. I, I formed a band and I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, um, and then, you know, the next, the next bit of the story was, was, a, was again, a, a, typical, a, a typical thing. Who remembers Kensington Market? So Kensington Market is something that we've got to get back towards Kensington Market. And a bit about this in a minute. Kensington Market was an amazing place. It was a, a dr as opposed to Camden, which was a hassle, you know, having a van, getting stuff out, pissing with rain, um, put the clothes back in after a rainy weekend, you get them back out on a Saturday and they'd stink of mould and actually be covered in mould, some of them. Kensington Market was Camden Market, but undercover. With a, with a pull-down shutter at your front that had security that was open six days a week, which was just as cheap as Camden. Camden cost, used to cost us £6 a weekend, our stall. Uh, Kensington Market was £18 a week. On Kensington High Street, uh, it's now bloody PC World. Um, what is, you know, and, and what is more important, Kensington High Street, the PC World, to society, oh, my God, Kensington Market, so much more, so much more important than a PC World. Why do we need PC World on Kensington High Street? I don't know. You know, we, ma, ma, terrible, planning, terrible planning decisions that went wrong, terrible attitudes towards pension funds, buying up, buying up properties and only renting them to um, big PLCs. Like, like, what a mistake this country made over land ownership on the high streets. But again, I'm not going to go into that, although, you know, we do need to address it. So we might address that issue in our thing, at which was going to start at 10 o'clock, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Um, um, Kensington Market was basically a place where for 18 quid you could go in there, you had a space about the size of here to the wall over there and kind of probably out to the first row. Jodie took a sewing machine in there, uh, she, she bought eight, eight, eight rolls of, of fabric from Blackburn Market, she created her first collection. She didn't put a label in it, in two, after two weeks um, I got a phone call, she'd got an order from, um, she said I've got, uh, we've had our first order, a wholesale order from another shop, I said oh that's fantastic. She said, I said, who's it from? She said, well, I've never heard of them, but everybody's egging me to take the order on, and it's a really big order. You know, I've got eight designs. They've ordered 200 of each. And I said, well, on a good day, you can make three, because she was sat there with a sewing machine. <laughs> I said, who the bloody hell, how, how the hell are you going to do that? She said, well, I had to take it, because it's this big company called Macy's New York. <laughs> I'd, never heard, I'd never heard of Macy's New York, neither had she. I'd only travelled once in my life. I'd been to Benidorm. She'd been to Torremolinos. <laughs> she, she was a bit posher than me. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, so we were, we were advised to go off to this thing called the BKCEC. Again, we'd never heard of it. The British Knitwear Clothing and Export Council on Portland Place. We got there. There's this export um, expert 
saying, oh, that, looking at the order, that's the best order we've seen from London Fashion Week. Geraldine chirps up, what's London Fashion Week? We'd never heard of it. It was evidently taking place down the road in, in Olympia. How, how could we have heard of it? We weren't from the fashion industry. We were, we, you know. and, and he said, who's your manufacturer? And I said, her. By this stage, it, <laughs> by this stage, it was all going completely wrong. And, 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 and so what did we do? Well, I went outside. No, no mobile phone, phones back then. This was 1981. Uh, went to a phone box, rang my mum. Like phoning a friend, isn't it, on who wants to be a millionaire? Um, she said, well, I've seen how much money you're taking on, on Camden, because she used to come down and help us count it, because the family had never seen money like that before. She said, right, well, I'm going to leave my job. She was working, wasn't it, working as a waitress in a cocktail, but it was almost, <laughs> it, it was almost that. She was, she was working, which, to those of you who don't know, is a human league song. <laughs> don't you want me, baby, isn't it? <laughs> um, Somebody can sing that. You girls, here. To, is there anybody with a Phil Hockey, hockey haircut? Well, well, actually, he's bold now, like me, so maybe I could sing it. Um, the, um, so she was working in a pub in Blackburn, and she, she decided to leave her job. She could sew. Uh, one of Geraldine's sisters, who was working for Riley's Snooker Tables in Accrington, um, that she left, and my mum got a lot of friends together, and, uh, and that was it. We set up, they set up a unit. Geraldine's dad became the delivery driver, moonlighting from his job. Uh, and, my, and my stepdad, who worked for ICI Plastics and was a factory manager, he moonlighted as well and did, and did some of the quality control. And, that's, and we delivered that order to Macy's New York, and we got another order. We had to come up with a label. We came up with a label, Red or Dead, uh, and, and, and that was that. And, and, and off we went and, and built the business. Um, I'm not going to tell the story about how we sold Red or Dead. You can maybe ask me at lunchtime if I'm around. It's, it's a really good story, because otherwise we, we, we would just get so far behind. But then... You know, what does, create, what does creative, creativity mean? Well, so for, 80, for 18 years, um, we did Red or Dead. And we were, we, 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 we'd been, you know, within, a, within one or two years of starting it, we were called fashion designers. We, we would never have called ourselves fashion designers because we never grew up with the, with the concept that you, uh, that there was a career in design. It, it just wasn't known to me. We just started something and got going. And... We, we, you know, Geraldine made clothes. Did, well, I suppose, so was that a designer? Yeah, well, I suppose it was. And then we started to get very... We won Designer of the Year for three years on a row. We couldn't believe what was happening. And eventually we started to call ourselves designers. But what we, what we really are, are... We've always had this thing that design is about improving things that matter in life. Well, is, is it design or is it that some people just can't move without feeling that things can be better. How many people in here, just it, it, during the day, or feel that there's something that they see or that they're doing that could be done better? Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of, of, so that's most people, because, you, because, you know, inherently this, this will be a room of creative people. I'll give you an example of, 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 how, of, of Jared. Geraldine has probably got the ultimate designer's brain in that she <coughs> never ever switches off and is never satisfied with she, she's, ha she's a happy person but it's always glass half full because everything that she sees she thinks she could be better and she can't stop thinking about it so if she gets on a tube in the morning and uh, I saw her doing it I saw her doing this once and I see it often and I say I know you're thinking about something at the moment and I remember once on the tube, and it was this, these new... The, has anybody used the new Metropolitan line with those new um, trade... Or, or, or like the Overland, where you can walk straight down the tube and they've got like a bendy bit. Uh, and um, and it, has anybody tried standing on the bendy bit? Right. So the idea was that you get more space in a tube um, by having this bendy bit, because there's no doors, and it obviously creates a, a, lot, a lot more space when you haven't got the doors and the gap and you've got a space you can stand on, which would normally be a drop down onto the track. So a really good idea, and also it's reconfigured better. But if you notice, next time you go on, you'll see there's a, the bendy bit is about from here to there, and, and nobody goes near it. <laughs> now, if you try to stand on it, it's really good fun, because you're going, you're like this, and your feet are going, but you can't fall anywhere, and, and you can't come to any harm, because obviously it's designed for you to stand on the bendy bit. But the reason why you can't stand on it, because there's nothing to hold on to. So all you, it's like surfing. and you, you, You'd look a bit stupid in the morning if you were, if you were surfing every morning down, down the Metropolitan Line from Wembley Park. So, so um, she, she, she's there, and she's, she starts to write things down. And she's writing down 
how many extra people you can get on that by just putting some le those leather straps, you know, those leather straps that you have. And she's like it everywhere. I I've seen her sat on the train from our home in Chichester, reworking out how the tables could go to fit more people in. She, it's just, but that's how the creative mind works. So, and, and it's, my, work, my mind works like that to a certain extent, but um, not quite to the extent of hers. But this is an example of me. I was on a train um, a decade ago, so we'd, we'd sold Red or Dead, and I was on the train, I was out to do some TV work in uh, BBC Cardiff, I think. So I got the train from Paddington, heading out, heading out through Swindon. As you pull out of Swindon Station, if anybody uses that line, you play this trick as well. Pull out of Swindon Station on your right-hand side, just as you're leaving the station, heading out west. You see this. This was a new housing estate back in... 2002, something like that, 2001. And it had Barrett's, sign, Barrett's signs hanging on the outside of it. Uh, Barrett's the house builder. Uh, and I looked at it and I thought, this, this is first time back. Well, it had put things up. It was at that time where they were really pushing 100% mortgages and 125% mortgages for young people for first time buyers. And I looked at it and I, my kids, my eldest kids will have, will have been in their teenage uh, young teenage years then. So my eldest kids are 26 and 25, so this is 10 years ago. Yeah, they'll have been 16 and 15, and then another one will have been 12. And, uh, and I thought, this is being built for their generation. That's who, it's first time, you know, and in, within 10 years, my kids, like me and Jody, might have settled down, had kids, although they've been brought up as southerners, so they probably won't have as kids quite as early as we did. Um, <laughs> But they'll, you know, they might be settling down, and this is the kind of housing that we're, built, that we're building for them. It's not council housing. It's, you know, only 30 percent, 20 odd percent of this was social housing. So set, the, the, the lion's share of this was, was housing, market housing to buy. And I kept thinking this is worse than much worse than the council housing that I was brought up in in Blackburn. Far, far worse. And I, I, maybe I'll have a picture of that in a bit. And it, it, all I could see was one thing. It looked like something else. In my mind, it looked like something else. Does, could that be something else in your mind? What, what could it be? OK, right. There must have been 15 people at least said that immediately in here with no, with no prompting. I gave no clues at all. How many of you who said that are architects, planners, um, sit on planning committees, or, or, or work for a house builder? None of you. How many of you ever thought that you could build a housing estate? None of you, probably. The fact is that you, you have just seen something that Swindon Planning Authority, the head of the planning, the head of the planning authority, the councillors, uh, Barrett's, and the architects, who I'm not going to name and are quite well known, who worked on that, couldn't see that they were fucking building a prison for the next, for the next generation. And it's, and, it's really, and it's really serious. And that's how, we, that's how we can all contribute to innovation. That's how we can crowdsource innovation. There is, it's not a black art. Design is not a black art. That has been designed absolutely bloody terribly by people who are not thinking for the good of society, who are thinking just to line their own bloody pockets. And that's where, you know, that's, that's where innovation can, it can make money, and it should make money, but it can also be for the common good. And, and that could have been done for the, that'll be pulled down, mark my words, 25 years from when it was, you think, of, think about the buildings that were, you know, I love some of the brutalist architecture with br brutalist housing estates that are being pulled down at the moment. And they, the only reason they're being, they're great because they've got, ma They've got 30% more space within the rooms than this housing that's being built today. They've, they were designed by architects who cared. The only reason why they are being pulled down is because the material, a lot of the materials that were used, uh, there was a lot of dodgy stuff went on with cement, but also they weren't looked after by councils, and, 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 and people, they, they weren't, mixed communities weren't put there. But again, I'm not going to do a talk on, on social housing and that. So what, so what did we do? What were the most important things then that we, di we did as designers then? Once, once, we, once I'd spotted that, what we did is we sent that picture up. 
Design is about provocation. Innovation is about provocation. Innovation is, is political, really, and should be really political. It should, it should stick pins in. It should then, then open that wound with a knife and then stick a sword in if necessary. And, and, that, and that's how we, without killing. So it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, I suppose it's like bullfighting, but you want the bull to live. You know, we, we, did, we, did that with, we did that with Swindon Council. We treated them as a bull. Um, I sent up, sent up this picture to Swindon Council, sent it to, sent it to the Swindon advertiser, sent it to the radio, local radio station. I was banned from Swindon. The front, the front, the front uh, I've got, I should dig the headline out, but it, on the front of the Swindon advertiser, it said, Wayne Hemingway, MBE, says that all housing in Swindon is like a prison. So I, then I, I agreed to go on the radio, and there was this phone in, and I was absolutely crucified by everybody, you know, how dare you and all this lot. But I thought, this is great, because my hero was David Bowie, and when I, I went to see him when I was 12 in, in, uh, in King George's Hall, Blackburn, and he was banned for wearing just a pair of underpants. And I thought, it, what, how amazing to get banned from Blackburn. I'd love to be banned from Blackburn. <laughs> And so I, I was basically, I felt like David Bowie had been banned from Swindon. It was, it was a great feeling. And I thought, I'm going to get ba I want to be banned from more towns. <laughs> so we went round and we took, up, we took these kind of pictures. Um, we took these pictures from, uh, in Gateshead, in, in Scunthorpe, in various towns, and sent very similar things up to, to towns. And we were basically, it was guerrilla warfare. And as, and, and then we, and as a result of it, we got... Contact and I, I was on Newsnight and I coined the phrase "wimpification and baratification of Britain" because of this. Because of what I was doing, it made the news and and uh, and people were all talking about. And I came up with this phrase, calling them noddy noddy houses, and uh, and just I was just really vocal about it. And then I came up with the phrase, "the wimpification and the baratification of Britain," attacking the national house builders. And as a result of that, uh, the, the chairman at the time of, of, of George Wimpy, Taylor Wimpy, is there known now said, I agree with a few of the things you're saying, let's make a difference together. So we went out, we researched it, uh, looked at things like this, looked at the fact that we were, that we were the, in Britain we had the highest teen pregnancy, the highest alcohol dependency in teens, the highest number of kids behind, under 18s behind bars are in Britain. 18% of our prison population are under 18. The next highest in Europe is Germany at 9%. We're double that. And I kept thinking, could this be the fact that young people today are, are, are being given, are being brought up in housing that is worse than my generation? It, and, and I thought that's got to be part of it, you know, because education is generally thought about to be better. Parenting's an issue, we know that, but it's not all about parenting, and parenting is very much wrapped up in, in, in the home where you live. So I kept thinking, so much about this, we, we can, you know, is about home. And then I started to take, you know, I started to question things like this. You know, what are these? People, people would say they're chavs, but to me, they're just young, young lads who, you know, have been brought up in, in a poor environment. Uh, they've been given five springy chickens to play on. <laughs> and, and, and we, you know, we've always been about, we've always been about free-range kids. And our kids, I, I was a free-range kid. Kid, my kids have been brought up to be like that, to wander free, to get out and do things. Our kids have never had, have never asked for a PlayStation or anything like that. Because they've been, I think, that it's a, it's a, I think it's a, to me, uh, you know, I've never wanted a PlayStation. I can't think of anything more boring to sit in front, to sit in front of virtual reality when you can be out bloody doing the real thing apart from shooting somebody. What's the point of playing, what's the point of playing football when you could get out and kick a ball if, you've got, if, you, if, you, if there's a bit of grass outside? What's the, what's the point in it? I don't get it. Unless it's pitch black and you can't go outside, maybe there's a point in it then. But, um, you know, we thought, you know, some of these kids, all they've got, I'll go back and quickly show you, oh, we're going the wrong way. I'm going to finish soon. You know, that there, that the only green space they've got there is that, and the ball would roll onto the road. Because it's a slope, you know. So maybe, maybe those kids are being forced inside to play on their PlayStation. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, this is just... We've got to do something about it. So... Sorry. Don't, no. Get there in a minute. So that we decided, after, see, after seeing the crap that was being built, we said to Wimpy... Right, the first thing, we're not going to design any houses yet. The last thing we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is build the environment. Uh, and we're going to design the environment. And they said, no, we're house builders. I said, no, people, never, people don't just buy a house. Who here has ever bought, a, people buy into a place. The first thing you, 
It's quite sad, I think, if you buy a house, but hate, you hate the place it's in. Uh, and we were trying to, we had that argument, we had, and it's now called placemaking. Uh, this, we, we, you know, and it's, it's an actual urban design and placemaking. So we, it's always been there as a phrase, but it wasn't used, and now the house builders will use it. A place is important. And we fought for that. I was made chair of Building for Life and all sorts of stuff. This is where I was brought up in Queen's Park Flats. And it was a place. Why was it a place? What does it look like to you? A what? Yeah. Does it look like an exciting place? Not really. Not really. Oh, it was. It was really exciting to be able to play in all of that, rather, you know, to be able to climb on those rocks. And, and we found modern day version. That's, that's how my wife was brought up in a two up, two down. That's the fact my wife's family home, two up, two down. Five sisters, so work that out. Two up, two down means two bedrooms. She's one of five sisters, all within eight years of each other. They worked hard. They went at it, didn't they? Bloody hell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And that's me, that's, me niece, that's me niece Meg and my nephew Tom. And the reason why that's a great place and is because it's got everything right about life on it. Um, so I'll just, I'm going to finish with this, I'm going to finish with this now because um, there is, you know, it, it's a, it, this, this is how, this is the best bit, I think this is the best bit of design that, that I have ever, ever done in my life. And, and it explains what, and I think it explains what innovation and design is all about and creativity is all about. We wanted to find a, an example of a, a place in the world where great housing was built. And we finally tracked somewhere down that we thought was perfect in Freiburg in Germany, a, a smallish, well, a university town in Germany. And we, we tracked it down by, we, we read up on this uh, cooperative housing that was built where the land was gifted uh, it's too, exp it's too complicated to explain how the land was, but the, go the, the local government gave some land to some creative people to basically take this land that was unloved and turn it into a, a great place to live. And the first thing that they did, they thought that something resonated with us. The first thing that they did is they built the play areas, and they built this one. And we went out to see it, and this play area ticked every box for me. Uh, in terms of it, it looked a bit challenging. It reminded me of a modern way of how, where I was brought up. And... Um, we took it to, our first housing development was in Gateshead. It was a big housing development. You can find out about this on, our, on the Hemingway Design website. It's under the state, it's called the States. It is in the urban design section, it's called the States. And it's worth having a look at. And we went, as we were designing it, we went up there and we said to the, we, we met the council play officer. And he said to me, um, we showed him this picture and he said, Wayne and Geraldine, we love what you're, what you're talking about here in free range, about free range kids, but you can't build a play area with sand on the ground. And I said, oh, is it about dogs and cats coming to do their stuff in it? We'll build, we'll build a fence around it. He said, no, it's not about that. He said, it's about uh, babies could crawl around in the sand and eat it. And, and I said, that's not a problem. We can replace it. It's $1.99 a bag at B&Q. <laughs> and then, and then, I went on the, then I went on to Google, typed in, child eats sand and dies... Uh, and you know what? There were no returns at all. <laughs> you could find child eats sand and gets bad shits, uh, but, that's, but that's very different to dying. And we changed planning policy. You know, we, and, and the whole thing is, is that that's what design is about, about changing hearts and minds, about sticking that, sticking that pin in, sticking that knife in. Uh, so, I mean, that's what hopefully you'll get involved in in the rest of the day and all the stuff that you're doing, is sticking those pins in. I've got one thing I've got to, got to talk about. Um, I've done me half an hour, but we're still 20 minutes behind. Um, we've now, there's, uh, there's, 12, there's 12 of us going to do this thing called Power of 12, where we're going to go into, uh, there's like a little fenced off bit, just as, as the door that you came in. And we want uh, David Harris, the executive uh, creative director of Wonderman, Ben Usher, the copywriter from Rap, Ben Novick, head of ads PR at Google, Simon Kershaw, creative director at VCC PME, Hannah Charlton, who's an innovator at Head Baker. Or is she an innovator and a Head Baker? <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Baroud, a, a marketing manager at Trinity School. Dan Machen, head of innovation at Billington Cartmel. Marcus Michaels, who's blank, he doesn't do anything. But I'm glad, <laughs> glad to have you here. Uh, Tim Hamill, <laughs> head of planning, market reach. Uh, and Roland Harwood is a founder of 100% Open. Uh, we're going to do what we're And you can all take part in this as well. Um, there's a charity that's being favoured today, which is called CSV, uh, which is, I assume, we couldn't find out, but I assume that means um, charity sector volunteering, but we can't. 
but, it, but that's what it basically is anyway. Charity sector volunteering. The, the, the premise is that um, volunteering is really important to this country and to society, as we know. It's quite difficult to, to get people, you know, there are, I think there's 150,000 volunteers in, in, who volunteer in this country, and we've all got a population of 60-odd million. Just think if we could make some serious inroads into those 60 million. Um, uh, to, to, charity, you know, it's part of the charity sector, and charity donations are down by 20% in this downturn, which, which is a pretty significant thing. We're going to go into a room, and we're going to try and work out how to make uh, volunteering sexy, easy, you know, how, how to... And the, the, old, the thing is, really, with volunteering, when you think about it, is that we probably all do want, we probably all do want to volunteer. You know, everybody, no matter how disenfranchised, will, will look after their mum, their nan, you know, and that, and that is volunteering. Even the rough, I see the roughest blokes so who you don't want to mess with at all, who, who sometimes are absolute nasty buggers, but they volunteer to be the linesman at, at a football match for their kids, probably to cheat, um, <laughs> on... on, 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 on on, on, a, on a Sunday, well, they do cheat, but on, on, a, on a Sunday morning. But, there's, you know, there's all, sorts, there's all sorts of volunteering. So, and you can, if you've got any... If you've got any, if you, if you've got any ideas how, you know, you think volunteering can work, can get better, how we can market it, you have to tweet. Somebody shout it out. It's written down here somewhere. Uh, yeah, hashtag power of 12, is that it? Yeah, that's... So tweet your ideas to hashtag power of 12. That's it. Thanks for listening.